From where we stand, the sun seems so calm and peaceful, but like humans, and basically the whole living world, the sun has its own phases when it's more or less active. It's just that the consequences are way bigger and more chaotic when the sun becomes hyperactive. Let's zoom in to see what's happening up there. So one of the ways we measure the activity of our star is by counting sunspots on its surface. Sunspots are dark patches that form when the sun's magnetic field gets all tangled up. It's simple. The more sunspots, the more active our sun is. And it seems the sun has been partying like crazy recently. The number of sunspots scientists have seen is the highest for nearly 21 years. In June, 163 sunspots appeared on the sun's surface. The last time we had so many dark patches across the sun was in September 2002, when there were 187 of them. Uh-oh. It seems this chaotic party is getting closer to its peak. And that's something we call solar maximum. How does all this even happen? The sun's magnetic field is strong and organized at some point. But as we said, sometimes comes the time when it kind of ends up tangled. Sort of like a ball of rubber bands that are wound together very tightly. This also means plasma is rising from the surface, forming loops and causing a mess in the shape of solar flares and something we call coronal mass ejections, CME. That's when plasma in the sun's upper atmosphere, called the corona, goes crazy and bursts really strong. Then at some point, this ball snaps and completely flips and turns the South Pole into the North Pole and vice versa. All this happens every 11 years or so. So when the sun comes into this phase when it becomes very active, it shoots out hot blobs of plasma, gets big dark spots as large as planets, and releases powerful eruptions of energy and radiation. Something fascinating happens when the sun becomes more active. A thing called plasma waterfall or polar crown prominence, PCP. It's like a mini eruption that starts on the sun, and it seems like it tries to get away, but then the sun's magnetic field pulls it back before it can escape into space. And this plasma waterfall's really spectacular. It goes up to 62,000 miles above the surface. It's like you stack eight Earths on top of each other. Then there's something called a polar vortex. It's like a gigantic halo of plasma that rotates around the sun's north pole really fast. This vortex happens when a large tentacle of plasma snaps apart and falls back toward the surface, similar to how a plasma waterfall forms. Scientists don't know why this plasma stays above the sun's surface for so long. And one of the cool examples of CMEs was a giant one in the shape of a butterfly in March this year. It got such an unusual shape because it exploded on the side of the sun we couldn't see, so it was impossible to fully measure how strong it was. Fortunately, that one didn't explode in our direction, but it might have hit Mercury a little bit. And it's possible it knocked off some dust and gas since Mercury has a weak magnetic field. All this sounds cool in theory, but it's not such good news for us. Because of all this, we might experience more intense solar storms that can, again, lead to geomagnetic storms on Earth. And these don't just sound alarming, they indeed are. They create chaos and disrupt the magnetic field of our planet. Geomagnetic storms can create beautiful northern lights, true. But we'd all rather enjoy such beauties as the aurora borealis in regular conditions, or just watch a good old sunset above the ocean. It's not that every solar storm will necessarily hit Earth, even if there are more of them. To reach our planet, they must be pointed in the right direction at the right moment. But if that happens, the storm can ionize the upper atmosphere and bye-bye our communications. It can cause temporary blackouts for systems such as GPS and radio. It isn't necessarily a big problem on its own, but it can be very dangerous if it happens at the wrong time, like during a tsunami or an earthquake. The storms can also damage electrical infrastructure, like rail lines and power grids. If you're on a plane at that time, you might be exposed to higher levels of radiation. It's still not clear how dangerous that will be for you, but it can be a serious problem for astronauts in space. When solar storms mess with the magnetic field, this can affect the migrations of some animals, such as sea turtles, whales, and birds. Since things in the animal kingdom mostly work in the natural order, who knows how these animals go through or even survive such changes? And when the sun is at a maximum of its activity, satellites in space are in trouble too. We have more satellites in space than ever before. And when the upper atmosphere becomes denser because of all these changes, this can push satellites in different directions. They might crash into one another or some can even fall back to Earth. 
Which, again, is only cool in movies with superheroes who can relatively easily deal with this stuff. Hopefully, we'll avoid a massive solar storm like the Carrington event. The story was similar. In August 1859, astronomers across the globe watched how the number of sunspots was getting bigger and bigger. A man named Richard Carrington was among them. At the beginning of September, he was sketching the sunspots when, out of a sudden, he was blinded by a flash of light. It lasted around five minutes, but it was spectacular. He later described it as a white light flare. It was a very strong coronal mass ejection CME, and in only 17.6 hours, this storm crossed the long way between the sun and our home planet, 90 million miles, and unleashed its force on us, even though this usually takes days. And when this storm started, telegraph machines across the world sparked. Operators got electric shocks and paper even caught fire. People were really scared and confused because they had never seen such bright skies before. Some even thought it was the end of the world. The next day, telegraph workers still couldn't work properly because Earth's atmosphere was still charged. They even managed to send messages using the auroral current instead of regular electricity. But it brought something incredible, two stunning auroras in the sky. People in Hawaii and Cuba could see beautiful northern lights, while those as far north as Chile could see the southern lights. It's all slowly but steadily escalating. Take solar flares, for example. These are powerful bursts of energy from the sun. In 2022, there were five times more of these flares compared to the previous year. Plus the strongest ones, X-class flares, have been getting stronger and more common than before too. And this might be way more extreme than anyone thought. Plus, it's likely to start a little bit earlier than we predicted. Scientists first thought the peak would happen in 2025, but it seems it could even occur by the end of 2023. We can't completely protect ourselves if a solar storm hits us directly, but we can still do some things like ground planes, adjust the paths of satellites in space, and try to make sure vulnerable infrastructure stays safe. To do all this, we need better solar weather forecasts to help us get ready for the worst. All this might sound very bad at first, but don't worry, solar flares won't destroy our planet. They do send charged solar material toward us at pretty high speeds, but it's not like we're completely doomed if these things hit us. Our planet won't leave us unprotected. We still have the atmosphere and magnetic field that keep us relatively safe. Our thick atmosphere is like a shield that blocks radiation that might harm us. So these solar flares can mostly affect technology, but they won't destroy Earth. I guess we have our own superheroes after all. If the sun decided to stop producing light, then the animals in the wild would be the first to notice. Most animals need daytime to roam from place to place, especially in the large savannas in Africa. Zebras, wildebeests, and giraffes all need the day to move to avoid predators. As soon as the sun goes down, it's their bedtime. If the sun suddenly went dark, animals wouldn't comprehend what was going on and would simply become an early lunch for predators. Nocturnal creatures would be equally confused at the time change. Birds usually flock during the day, so we wouldn't hear or see any of them. We have them to thank for eating pests in the sky. Well, them and bats. But if you're in an area with no bats, then consider the insects to be the winners here. Temperatures would start to drop gradually humans would notice the effects as well. We're used to having the sun shining at the peak of noon, but with the sunshine's disappearance, we would be living in total darkness. It'd just be a matter of survival. If the sun suddenly got dark, then we'd only have around eight minutes to enjoy the rest of it. That's because it takes that much time for sunlight to travel thousands of miles across the solar system. We would have to use UV lights to grow some crops, but it wouldn't be enough to feed the whole world, not to mention the dropping temperatures across the world. Survival would be difficult in the open plain. Everyone would have to duck inside shelters and warm bunkers. Plants need photosynthesis to grow. Without it, we wouldn't have any crops. Bread wouldn't exist since it needs wheat. Even the algae in the oceans need photosynthesis to survive, which is the highest source of oxygen rather than forests. This means oxygen levels would start to deplete. Large bodies of water like lakes, oceans, and seas would also start to lack oxygen to sustain marine life. 
One of our main sources of vitamin D is the sun. There are other ways of getting it, but the sun is the best and most convenient way. Without crops or vegetation, all the herbivores would have to rummage for the last green grass on land or a leaf hanging from a tree. They would soon run out of food, which would also be bad news for us humans, since we need animals like cows, horses, and sheep for our livelihoods. This wouldn't happen overnight. Of course, the oceans would remain warm for some time, but eventually, they would get cold and freeze. Earth is still a planet powered by an iron core that produces so much heat. This would not be enough to keep the planet warm. Our next step would be finding the right shelter and keeping warm. If this happened overnight, then chances are there wouldn't be any ready-made bunkers for a scenario like this. Unless you're watching this video and decide to build one after. They would have to provide heat 24-7 and be capable of growing crops under UV light. Solar-powered facilities would be a thing of the past. People would have to wear sustainable suits when venturing out into the open. Since it would be so dark, we would need strong lights or powerful night vision goggles to see anything. The lands would be desolate. Nocturnal creatures that can handle freezing temperatures would take it over. Structures would collapse since there would be oxygen depletion. Concrete needs oxygen to remain intact. The bunkers themselves would have limited oxygen as well. We would need to uproot many trees and place them under strong UV lights for them to produce oxygen. In turn, it would produce its ecosystem in the large underground bunkers. The oceans on the surface would freeze over eventually. Gathering any natural resources from the ocean floor, like gas or oil, would be impossible. The large object, which used to be a bright and sunny star, would still be floating around. But what would happen if the sun disappeared overnight? Well, pretty much the same thing, except way worse. The sun is the largest celestial object in our solar system, which keeps all of our planets lined up the way they are. They orbit around the sun, minding their own business. Without such a large object keeping them steady, the planets would start to float around randomly. Some might even collide with each other. In other cases, the planets would just float around and fly off into space eventually, until they found a new star to orbit around. Earth might or might not be one of those planets. Our planet would still be dark. We would be flying through space at an unusual speed. The planet wouldn't rotate on itself, and many objects would crash into us. We'd be in the trajectory line of mass comets waiting to strike us down. The threat of the cold wouldn't be a major factor anymore. It would be what's beyond us. This means we'd have to dig our bunkers deeper. We wouldn't have an atmosphere anymore to trap any form of heat or anything we would be floating for an eternity. But let's go back to that scenario where the sun just decided to go dark. Don't worry, our planet would still be orbiting the sun along with the other planets. The temperatures would keep plummeting until nothing could survive on the surface. It would be total darkness 24-7. Only bacteria and possibly tardigrades could survive on the surface. Tardigrades are microscopic critters that can survive just about anything, including outer space. Eventually, oxygen would be absent from the Earth's surface, and there wouldn't be anything up there anymore, except for them. Since they would be the dominant and possibly the only creatures on the surface, they'd manage to evolve into bigger species and produce many more. Hundreds of thousands of years into the future, humans would have had to evolve to the conditions underground. Our eyes would be much bigger to take up as much light as possible. Our skin would become whiter since there would be no sun underground. Our hearing would also be much more sensitive since the underground would create echoing sounds. We'd still have the intellect we do now, but our bodies would be ready for the surface. The main threat would be the giant tardigrades sluggishly dragging themselves around. Under a microscope, they look kind of cute, but imagine them the size of a polar bear. Still want something like this in your backyard? They can live anywhere so they'd infiltrate the bunkers now and then. They'd get ferocious and come in different sizes and shapes. At this point, humans would not be the dominant species since they'd have to hide underground. Some tardigrades from different tribes wouldn't be friendly with each other. Major cities that used to be bustling with people would be home to giant water bears. 
Tardigrades are known as water bears since they kind of look like little bears. But these beasts with eight legs would be much bigger than them. Bears and most animals would have been wiped out on the surface. Under the ice, some deep sea creatures would thrive and have moved closer to the surface. These animals were used to living in darkness away from the sun. But over thousands of years of dominating the waters, they'd have grown to enormous sizes. Some of these creatures would adapt to crawling out of the mainland. Even though the surface would be frozen, they'd still find ways to crack through the ice and make their way. Humans, meanwhile, would create large underground channels and networks, building cities and colonies. We'd dominate the tunnels where our hands and feet would grow to become web-like and large. we take over everything underground and remain the smartest species on Earth. We'd manage to keep old art pieces from the surface and important records to stay as human as possible. We'd keep on surviving no matter what. Now in space, inky darkness between blinding points of light does a great job. It hides black holes, gaping, hungry, and scary. Their blackness makes it really difficult for astronomers to find detailed information about these space monsters. When a powerful and massive star reaches the end of its life, it can't just fade into nothingness. One of the most likely scenarios, the star will run out of its nuclear fuel. Then, in a blazing flash of light, it'll collapse under its own gravity. If the star was large enough, it'll turn into a black hole. There's a hypothetical type of black hole called primordial. Scientists have never gotten any real proof of their existence. These holes are insanely old and quite tiny, by black hole standards, that is. Astronomers believe they could appear several milliseconds after the Big Bang. At that time, stars and galaxies weren't born yet. It means primordial black holes probably witnessed the entire history of the universe. By now, the smallest primordial black holes have most likely evaporated away. But the bigger ones can still be scattered out there in space. But how did primordial black holes appear in the first place? In the very beginning, space wasn't the same. In some regions, it was hotter. In others, cooler. And some areas were extremely dense. Scientists believe these dense spots could collapse into primordial black holes. The most curious thing, though? These holes might be so small exactly because they popped up right after the Big Bang. The longer it took a black hole to appear, the larger it was. The mass difference between older, smaller, and younger, bigger black holes was incredible. Compare the mass thousand times greater than our sun's and that of a jelly bean. Now you get it. There was a theory that primordial black holes could actually be dark matter. This matter is believed to make up around 80% of the mass of the observable universe. Astronomers can't see this bizarre ingredient directly, since it doesn't emit light or any kind of energy. The idea remained unpopular for decades. But recently, scientists have realized there are many more black holes in the universe than they used to think. And it means the theory might actually work. And the vast and still hidden from us population of Big Bang black holes could not only make up but be dark matter. After all, astronomers haven't discovered a single dark matter particle yet, even after decades of searching. Some scientists argue that dark matter can't be tons of multi-sized primordial black holes. They would collide far too often for this to work out. Others object that black holes might exist in twos. And then a third one can always approach the pair and replace one of the initial holes. After all, our universe is swarming with black holes, and there's no lack of them. This process would repeat again and again, meaning there would be almost no merges or collisions. Primordial black holes might stay in clusters the size of the distance between our sun and the nearest star. Each of these clusters can be home to thousands of black holes, all crammed together. A 30 solar mass monster of a black hole might sit at the center, with more common stellar ones occupying the rest of the space. Such clusters can be everywhere astronomers think dark matter is. But so far, this is still only an exciting theory. And some scientists don't support it yet. More data is needed. Now, black holes sometimes behave like massive galactic volcanoes. From time to time, they flare up. But instead of spewing lava, 
they produce enormous amounts of energy, and it makes gaping holes in the surrounding material and gas. A short while ago, scientists discovered one of the largest craters in the universe. Radio and X-ray telescopes detected a supermassive black hole that threw a temper tantrum many, many, many years ago. It happened in a galaxy cluster about 390 million light-years away from Earth. The crater left behind, which was actually a hole punched in the cluster's hot gas, could fit 15 Milky Way galaxies. Whoa! Recently, astronomers have found out that one of the most massive stars in the neighborhood might just have vanished. The star used to hover in space 75 million light-years away from Earth. It's usually too far away for scientists to clearly see individual stars. Unless they're really massive, like the one we're talking about. It was gigantic and shining 2.5 million times brighter than our sun. For the last time, astronomers saw the star's light in 2011. But when they decided to examine it more closely several years later, they couldn't find it. Such huge stars usually go out in an extremely bright supernova. But nothing here, which puzzled the scientists to no end. There's a theory it collapsed into a black hole, and it happened without triggering a supernova first. It does occur among stars nearing the end of their lives, but very, very rarely. KB141b is a planet outside of our solar system. At first glance, it's not that different from Earth. It has liquid oceans that evaporate into clouds, condense, and get back to the surface as rain. But instead of water, this all happens with rock. The surface of the exoplanet is covered with lava seas tens of miles deep. The temperature on K2141b reaches 5,000 degrees during the day. It's hot enough for the magma in the oceans to vaporize into the atmosphere. Then, supersonic winds, which can move at the speed of one mile per second, carry this rock vapor to the planet's night side. The vaporized magma cools down, becomes liquid again, and falls as a rocky rain. Well, looks like we're gonna need a bigger bumper shoot. A star in the galaxy GSN 069 might turn into a planet the size of Jupiter in the next trillion years or so. All thanks to the star's regular encounters with a black hole. First, astronomers noticed bizarre X-ray bursts. Those were super bright and went off every 9 hours. After examining this phenomenon, the researchers realized it was a star getting flung in a unique orbit around a black hole. And the flashes they saw were the material being slurped off the star's surface. It happened every time the star darted past its greedy host. Over millions of years, the black hole has already transformed the red giant into a white dwarf. And the process isn't going to stop anytime soon. Astronomers have recently discovered some traces of phosphine in Venus's atmosphere. On Earth, this colorless and flammable gas is often found near microbes. That's why a new theory claims there might be life on Venus. But if there is, it could only appear high in the clouds because no living organism would be able to survive the planet's extreme environment. Its surface is incredibly dry, with no liquid water, and the pressure 90 times greater than that on Earth's surface. The temperatures there reach almost 900 degrees, hot enough to melt certain metals. So that's a no? Methane, a gas that's usually produced by living things, was found on Mars in 2013. European Space Agency's Mars Express spacecraft detected it in Gale Crater near the Martian equator. This discovery might one day answer the question if there's life on Mars. Asteroid 2019-OK scared scientists by sneaking up on our planet in July of 2019. This rather large rock, up to 400 feet across, appeared seemingly out of nowhere. It traveled uncomfortably close to the Earth a mere 45,000 miles away. That's less than one-fifth of the distance to the Moon. The Sun's outer layer is way hotter than its surface. The temperatures vary from 10,000 degrees close to the surface and a mind-boggling 1 million degrees in the corona. That's the Sun's outermost layer. The reason for this phenomenon might be nano-flares. Those are regular, powerful bursts of heat from the star. 
Another theory blames the layer that lies just beneath the sun's surface. It seems to generate a weak magnetic field. That's why, when the energy from this layer leaves the sun, it heats the corona through a mesh of magnetic branches and roots. The moon might still be shrinking. Our planet's natural satellite has become 150 feet skinnier than it used to be several hundred million years ago. If its insides keep cooling, it might explain the quakes shaking the moon's surface. In 2019, NASA's InSight lander, whose goal was to study the interior of Mars, registered the first Mars quake ever. These quakes were coming fast, about two per day. Most of them were tiny. You wouldn't even feel them if they happened on our planet. So far, more than 300 Mars quakes have been detected. Those are the first quakes on any space body other than the Earth and the Moon. Another mysterious phenomenon discovered by the mission was bizarre magnetic pulses. They occurred every midnight around the lander. It's still unclear what those pulses are. Maybe after midnight, they're going to let it all hang out. Or something. Pluto's atmosphere rises much higher above the surface of the dwarf planet than, let's say, Earth's. It also has more than 20 layers, all of them freezing cold and extremely condensed. Oh, by the way, our moon also has some sort of atmosphere. Called an exosphere, it consists of helium, neon, and argon. It's 10 trillion times less dense than Earth's atmosphere. Or, you know, really thin. Buckle up, fellow space enthusiasts, because we're about to uncover the celestial secrets that have been unveiled this year. From giant stars to organic molecules, this year is going great for astronomers. So let's catch up on all the excitement you might have missed in 2023. First of all, we've discovered some real astral monsters. Imagine looking up at the night sky and seeing stars that are not just big, but absolutely enormous. Scientists have been using a special telescope called the James Webb Space Telescope to explore the early days of the universe. And during their adventure, scientists stumbled upon ancient stars that are 10,000 times bigger than our sun. Yes, you heard it right, 10,000 times. These giants of the stellar world were some of the very first stars ever to form in the universe billions of years ago. Imagine a globular cluster as a massive cosmic crew, where each group consists of a whopping 100,000 to 1 million members. These clusters are like giant family gatherings, with all the stars being born around the same time. But what makes these newly discovered monsters so special? Well, their cores, or their central parts, are way hotter than what we see in stars today. Scientists think that this intense heat might be due to a lot of hydrogen burning at really high temperatures. It's like they're having a galactic barbecue party. Something fascinating happens in these globular clusters. The smaller stars crash into the supermassive ones and gain extra energy, like a power-up. But here's the twist. Most of these clusters are now getting old, and the supermassive stars disappeared a long time ago. We can only see hints of their existence in the clusters we observe today. Scientists study them by just the mysterious traces of their grand presence. The discovery of these monster stars is incredibly important for our understanding of the universe. If scientists can gather more evidence to confirm their existence, it would be a major breakthrough. It would help us learn more about globular clusters and how supermassive stars form in general. But that was only the first fascinating discovery of 2023. Although the next one is kind of sad. You know those beautiful rings that make Saturn look so fancy? Well, guess what? They might disappear in the not-so-distant future, astronomically speaking. NASA's Cassini mission, which explored Saturn from 2004 to 2017, gathered some fascinating data about the rings. During Cassini's grand finale, when it did some cool maneuvers between Saturn Scientists noticed something surprising. The rings were losing a lot of mass every second. Tons of it. That means this magnificent halo will only stick around for a few hundred million more years, at most. That may seem like a long time for humans, but in the grand scheme of the universe, it's just a blink of an eye. 
The important thing is that we've learned that huge rings like Saturn's don't last forever. They eventually fade away. Oh, well, at least you and I personally won't catch this moment. Scientists have a fun theory about what will happen when Saturn's rings disappear. They think that the other ice and gas giants in our solar system, like Uranus and Jupiter, might have once had massive rings too. But over time, those rings wore down and became more like the thin, wispy bands of asteroids like what Uranus has now. Saturn's rings are mostly made of ice, but they also have a sprinkling of rocky dust. This dust comes from asteroids and teeny tiny meteoroids crashing into the celestial objects and breaking apart. It's like a snowstorm of icy particles and space debris. The research also revealed that Saturn's rings appeared long after the planet itself formed. They were still forming when dinosaurs roamed the Earth. So, in terms of astronomical age, they're actually quite young, only a few hundred million years old. This discovery has got scientists all excited because it means something dramatic happened in Saturn's past to create this stunning icy disk. But this is a mystery waiting to be solved. Scientists want to figure out what exactly caused the rings to form and why they have such a breathtaking structure. Let's hope they'll figure it out. But moving on to something more optimistic, we have another exciting space news. Recently, scientists have been studying one of the most distant galaxies in the universe, and they found something amazing. Organic molecules. The galaxy in question has a long name SPT-04-1847. It's over 12 billion light years away from our little blue planet. Can you even imagine that distance? It's the farthest galaxy ever known, where complex organic molecules have been found. That's why looking at this galaxy is like looking at something from when the universe was just a baby. We have no idea what this galaxy looks like now. The light that has reached us is what it looked like when the universe was only 1.5 billion years old. Imagine being able to see things from so far in the past. So what they found is something with a very complicated name. A polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon molecule or simply PAH molecule. You might be wondering, what in the world is that? Well, guess what? You can actually find these molecules right here on our planet. They can be in things like the smoke from car engines or even forest fires. PAH molecules are made up of chains of carbon atoms. And here's the super cool part. They're considered the basic building blocks for life. Imagine that, life's building blocks those tiny carbon chains being discovered in a galaxy that's so far away. That's like finding a needle in a haystack. They also found out that gas floating around in that galaxy is filled with heavy elements. That's a big deal because it suggests that many stars have come and gone there, creating all these amazing elements. This means that this galaxy can be potentially rich in many other elements too. This discovery opens up a world of possibilities and raises so many exciting questions. How did these molecules form in a galaxy so distant? And since we're looking into the past, what could have happened to these organic molecules during this time? Could they have evolved into life? We're only scratching the surface of the incredible things waiting to be uncovered. By the way, if it's so far, how did scientists even manage to discover something like that? Well, they had the instrument called the James Webb Space Telescope. This fancy telescope was recently launched and has superpowers when it comes to observing the universe. So when the scientists were studying this faraway galaxy, they had a little problem. The light coming from those distant objects was so faint that it was hard to see or detect. But guess what? They had a brilliant idea to solve this. They used something called gravitational lensing, which is like a special power of nature's magnifying glass. Imagine two galaxies lining up perfectly, just like in a photo shoot. The light from the faraway galaxy, the background one, travels towards us. But on its journey, it passes through the foreground galaxy, which is like a giant space lens. And guess what? 
the foreground galaxy's gravity bends the light, just like a magnifying glass, making it bigger and brighter. It's like having a cosmic zoom lens for our telescopes. This bending of light creates a super cool shape called an Einstein ring. It's like a halo, or a ring of light surrounding the foreground galaxy, basically a nature's way of showing off its magical powers. With gravitational lensing and these beautiful Einstein rings, scientists can see distant objects more clearly and learn amazing things about the universe. And thanks to all that, they managed to uncover the hidden chemical interactions from the early galaxies. Isn't that incredible? The scientists are beyond excited about this discovery. They never expected to find such complex organic molecules in a galaxy that's incredibly distant. Who knows, maybe this is just the beginning of a thrilling cosmic journey. So, keep your eyes on the stars, fellow space explorers. The universe is full of surprises, and who knows what other mind-blowing discoveries await us out there. Let's hope we'll learn even more in the future. It's September 1977. You're playing one of the first video game consoles released in North America. You step outside and see the whole neighborhood waiting for Voyager 1 to launch. It's a super sunny day, so you squint a little, trying to see what's happening. You live in the neighborhood right outside the launching station. You get yourself some food and watch the Voyager take off into space. You're so impressed, you decide to dedicate your career to working with NASA. 35 years later. You're now a senior official in NASA, specializing in Voyager 1. It's 2012, and you're sitting in the control room with your colleagues. Everyone is staring at their computer screens as they work on the Voyager. You're sitting on the top, overlooking everything and making sure all systems are in check. This day is special, as Voyager 1 is about to exit the heliosphere which is a science word for the outer shell of our solar system. It's a bubble of space affected by the solar wind, which comes from the sun. By 2021, it got 14 billion miles away from Earth, which is equivalent to 153 astronomical units from the sun. One astronomical unit is the distance between the sun and the Earth. The craft was originally meant to fly by Uranus, Saturn, and Jupiter, and toss itself from one planet to another with the use of their gravitational pull. Everyone is impatiently waiting for it to exit the heliosphere. Three, two, one, and it's officially out. All systems are normal and functioning. You praise your team for doing an excellent job. With Voyager 1 reaching this far, there's still tons to explore in outer space. You were once a young adult watching the craft launch outside your neighborhood. And now, you're the main person in charge of the operation. Nine years later. Since Voyager 1 left the heliosphere, you've been checking up on it every now and then, making sure all systems and functions are in order. It's been sending back measurements of the interstellar medium. It's the area between the stars of our galaxy, consisting of ionized materials. Ionized is basically a simple version of a molecule or substance. The interstellar medium is an electrically charged state of plasma, or ionized plasma, and is very unstable. It's like going from lightning in a thunderstorm back to calm rain in a matter of seconds. The plasma up there is different than the plasma on Earth, in that it's difficult to filter out. There are around 0.06 atoms for every cubic inch in the interstellar medium. The air we breathe on Earth has billions of atoms. By measuring the plasma in the interstellar medium, we can further understand the behavior and structure of chemicals and gases. It's possible that the oxygen we know and love on Earth is different than the ones out there. One of your main tasks is to learn more about how the solar wind from the sun and interstellar medium interact with each other to create the heliosphere. So, after doing some routine checkups and other maintenance work on Voyager 1 from the control room, you notice something strange coming from the screen. You sit in front of the computer, crunching the numbers of the plasma vibrations and convert them into an audio file of about three kilohertz. You click on it and listen to an eerie, subtle hum. You and your team are surprised that these vibrations occurred in such a small frequency. 
Given that space is massive, something like this might mean life on other planets. Everyone else at the station rushes to the control room to listen to that sound from outer space. It's monotonous and faint, but it's definitely coming from outside the heliosphere. You run the numbers over and over to make sure it's not a fluke, but it's on point. You make sure your team doesn't spill the beans to anyone outside until everything is known and clear. You get into beast mode with work and try to catch the sound again, and it remains. You can't sleep trying to think of something that could be producing this hum. A few days pass by, and the sound is pretty consistent. If there was some life out there trying to communicate with you, then surely it would have said something that can be deciphered. You analyze the audio files once again, trying to see if it's some phonetic language you don't know. You call in a linguist to see if she can make something out of it. You and the squad gather around, waiting impatiently for some answers. After a while, she believes that it might be someone out there communicating with us, but the only way to find out is by sending something back to them. You arrange a meeting with your team and try to figure out what message you can send. After much thinking and lots of coffee, you decide to send them one phrase in English. Who are you? You send out the signal through Voyager 1 and wait for any changes in the hum, but you don't get anything straight away. It may take some time for a response. You wait all night and still there's nothing. It's starting to look like there isn't anything out there. For the next couple of days, you keep sending out phrases for anything to pick up. Since space is a vacuum, sound waves can't travel. So sending out voice messages on a large speaker won't work. You locate the source of the humming and aim for it when sending the audio file. Every day, you send something different, but still, you don't hear anything from them for a week. It seems that intelligent life in the distant world isn't real. The areas between the star systems and a galaxy aren't necessarily a complete vacuum. That's where the interstellar medium is. It contains gases, dust, and cosmic rays, which are energy particles. After many months of this constant humming being produced, you still try to figure out what's going on. You sit there, remembering the time when the Voyager was first launched. You remember running outside after playing some video games. You couldn't see properly because of the sun, and you freeze in your spot and have a eureka moment. You go through some notes taken in the past. The answer was in front of you all this time. Every now and then, the sun sends a burst of energy that causes the plasma of interstellar space to vibrate. Scientists can measure the frequency of waves when the plasma vibrates to show how close they are to each other. And on the day when the hum was delivered, there were some irregular frequencies coming from the sun. So that hum might have been the plasma vibrating in a weird way because of the sun flares. But these low-level vibrations last longer than quick jumps and spikes. They're fainter. You run the tests again and find out that it's not some intelligent life forms out there trying to talk to you. It's the little vibrations caused by sun flares. You notify your team about this breakthrough and everyone's celebrating. But after all these tests and research, you still don't know why plasma mm. in the interstellar medium vibrates in such a way. Those answers will have to wait. 2027. It's been 50 years since the launch of Voyager 1. You're way into your senior years and just retired from NASA. You have many scholarships in your name and programs for young people who want to learn about space and science. You go back to the control room once more, where you thought you had discovered intelligent life on a distant world. Then you remember all the good times you had. You say goodbye to everything, knowing that this is Voyager's final moments. It was built to last up to 50 years. After that, It'll just be a floating object in the vastness of space. It's already surprising to know that this is Earth's most distant object from us, but it's time to let others take your place. You shut off the lights and close the door. The Voyager makes one last beep before eternal silence. So you fall right into the heart of the black hole and prepare for a sad end. Well, you don't have to. Falling into a black hole won't necessarily destroy you or your spaceship. 
you have to choose a bigger black hole to survive. If you fall into a small black hole, its event horizon is too narrow, and the gravity increases every inch down. So if you extend your arm forward, the gravity on your fingers is much stronger than on your elbow. This will make your hand lengthen, and you'll feel some discomfort. Rather significant, to be honest. Things change if you fall into a supermassive black hole, like the ones in the center of galaxies. They can be millions of times heavier than our sun. Their event horizon is wide, and gravity doesn't change as quickly. So the force you'll feel at your heels and at the top of your head will be about the same. And you can go all the way to the heart of the black hole. This myth is busted. The next myth claims we can save the Earth from a giant asteroid with a big bam. The familiar plot is that a spaceship lands on the surface of an asteroid. A team of astronauts quickly drills a hole in it, leaves a present there, and flies away. Then, bam! As a result, the asteroid may break into several pieces and continue on its way to Earth. Well, big chunks of the asteroid fall to our surface, causing a lot of damage. So our mission is failed. Well, to save Earth, we need a really big bam. Not only outside the asteroid, but right above its surface. When the boom happens, the force of the blast pushes the asteroid slightly downward. Even a slight change in trajectory would be enough to make the asteroid fly past the Earth in the future. Done! Oh, and if you made a big boom on an asteroid, you'd never be able to hear its loud sound. Yeah, we often hear the sound of spaceships and battle in space in the movies, but that's just a myth. Sound is a wave that spreads because of the vibrations of molecules. A person claps a few feet away from you. The sound wave begins to push the first air molecule next to the clap, then the third, fourth, and so on until the wave reaches your ear. So, to spread sound, we need molecules like air or water. In our atmosphere, sound waves spread out just fine, but space is a vacuum, so it's nothing here. You can clap your hands loudly there, but there just won't be any molecules that can vibrate and carry that sound. One more myth about asteroids. We need to fly a little farther than Mars' orbit. Whoa! We're in an asteroid belt, and we constantly have to dodge giant rocks and blocks of ice. We got in some dense asteroid cloud. Mm, Not true. The fact is that space is huge, and the distances are incredible. All the rocks and debris in the asteroid belt are only 4% of the weight of the moon, so there really aren't that many of them there. To understand the size of the emptiness in space, look at the collision of two galaxies. There are billions of stars in each of them, If we mix them up, it's unlikely there will be any collisions even here. Another myth is that there's zero gravity in our orbit. Imagine you're in a huge box 10 miles up in the air. Now we let go of the box and it starts to fall. You're falling simultaneously with the box at the same speed. And now it's as if you feel zero gravity. Well, the same thing happens in orbit. The International Space Station is 250 miles above the Earth, and it's falling continuously, though not on the surface of the planet, but around it in its orbit. Its speed at this point is about 4.7 miles per second. It could cross the United States from the West Coast to the East Coast in just 8 minutes. So the astronauts there are experiencing the same thing. They're just falling with the ISS at that speed. Now let's look at the Moon. It always looks at us with one side. This means the moon has a dark side and the sun's rays never get there. Well, that's a myth. The whole point is that the moon is gravitationally locked to the Earth. There are days and nights there too. It's just that this rotation is perfectly aligned with the rotation of the Earth. So whenever you look at the moon, you only see one side. Although there are days when the sun shines there too, So it's not the dark side, it's the far side. And we even have pictures of this place. And there's one of the biggest craters in our entire solar system, the South Pole Aiken Basin. It's as wide as two states of Texas. One myth that turned out to be untrue is that people have never actually been on the moon. This is the original spacesuit of the first astronauts who were there. Look at the sole of the shoe. 
Some people claim there's no way they could have left footprints like this there. Actually, they could. On the moon, the astronauts wore extra boots over their suits, and their soles matched the footprints on the moon perfectly. The astronauts didn't grab them when they left the moon. They left a lot of stuff there, too. They even ripped out the armrests of the seats of the lunar module to reduce its weight. Now, the total weight of human trash on the moon is about 187 tons, including several lunar rovers, spacecraft debris, rocket stages, and lunar probes. That's like three Boeing 737s. The next myth is about summer. The hot season comes because the Earth approaches the closest distance to the sun in a year. The sun warms our planet more, and we all have to go to the beach. Well, not true. Let's draw an axis through our planet. It's slightly tilted on one side, and winter comes when our planet's axis is tilted away from the sun. But over time, the axis tilts toward the hot star. Then its rays shine at such an angle that it gets warmer. It's true, though, that the Earth happens to be at a different distances from the sun. This is because our orbit is not a perfect circle, but slightly flattened, an ellipse. Normally, we think of the distance to our star as about 93 million miles. But that distance may be longer or shorter than 3 million miles, depending on which point in our orbit we pass. Another myth about the Sun is that it's yellow. Well, let's send you into space for this one. You look out the window and… it's white. The Sun only appears yellow to us through the filter of our atmosphere. The composition of the air and its thickness just distorts the light of the star. But stars do come in different colors. Cooler stars have bright orange and red colors. These are usually very old stars, older than our sun. But young and very hot stars are bright blue. The sun is about in the middle of the spectrum. You've also heard about how if you take your spacesuit off in outer space, you'll blow up like a balloon. Well, our bodies are designed to function at atmospheric pressure, like outside. But space is a vacuum. Imagine a huge metal barrel, and we sucked all the air out from there. Add to that a temperature of minus 455 degrees Fahrenheit, and you have space. If you could get into those conditions, all the air pockets in our body, like our lungs, would start to expand. So you really could blow up like a balloon if it weren't for our elastic tissues. They stretch and bend, so you keep your body size. You'll have enough oxygen in your body to last about 20 seconds. Then your brain will begin to starve, and soon you'll pass out. So you won't blow up, and you won't even freeze because you'll be in a vacuum. It doesn't conduct heat. For example, water conducts heat very well, and you feel cold from it instantly. But you feel better in the air of the same temperature. If you're in the vacuum of space, the super low temperature won't be a problem for you. Much worse is solar radiation. On Earth, we have a shield against radiation in the form of the atmosphere. It blocks the harmful rays. In outer space, you would be defenseless. Another myth is related to cell phones. People think that when you dial your friend's number, your phone sends a signal into space. There are a bunch of satellites out there that will pick up your signal and reflect it like a mirror right into your friend's home. No, not true. However, there are satellite phones in the world that work that way. But when you make a cell phone call, your signal is transmitted through a system of cell towers from one to another until it gets to your friend's phone. The snow-capped shape of Mount Taranaki in the middle of Egmont National Park in New Zealand is surrounded by a dense, dark-colored forest. It creates a gloomy green circle around the area. From above, the circle looks almost perfect. But it's only because of the local farmers. They use all the fertile soil they can, and it results in a contrasting color scheme. A near-perfect cone volcano, a rare geological phenomenon, has occasionally been erupting for over 100,000 years. It grew taller and larger after every eruption. It's predicted that in about 50 years, this volcano could turn the area around it into another Pompeii. In Italy, there's a unique spot known as the Giant Pink Bunny. You can find this humongous art project on the green fields of the Coletto Fava Mountain in northern Italy. 
the 200-foot-long and 20-foot-high bunny appeared in 2005. It was created by the art group Gelatin from Vienna. Not only does it have a strange and unique design, but it's also knitted. It took the team five years to finish the delicate structure. It used to be just like any other stuffed toy. Visitors could climb the bunny, taking in the views around them. But since it was placed on the hills, the art piece has started decaying. After all, it was only meant to last 20 years at the most. The once bright pink bunny has turned gray and has almost disappeared. If you look at the Google Maps satellite images these days, you might only notice its outline. While not as popular as Old Faithful, the Grand Prismatic Spring in Yellowstone Park, Wyoming is one of the most spectacular sights to see even from ground level. But from above, the bright bands of orange, yellow, and green really start showing their beauty. It's one of the biggest springs in the world, larger than a football field at 370 feet across. The hot water in it travels 121 feet to the surface. The spring is a feeding ground for heat-loving bacteria that change their color in the cooler water. A director searching for an unusual area for filming discovered a mysterious floating island in northeastern Argentina. Almost perfectly round and surrounded by a dark forest, it gives you an eerie feeling. No wonder the place got nicknamed The Eye. With the help of time lapses on Google Earth, it was discovered that the inner landmass was moving around rather than sitting still as was first believed. A circle of land 387 feet in diameter, ranging from several inches to many feet in thickness, casually floats in the clear waters. It even rotates slowly, pushed by the cold water from below. This water is still being studied. It's completely exclusive to the surrounding area. From above, it looks like nothing more than a little island sitting in Homebush Bay, Australia. But zooming in will change that perspective. Once a successful trading port, the bay is filled with four abandoned cargo freighters that were too hard to remove. Once they became decommissioned, they were left in the bay and forgotten. The shipwreck SS Airfield transformed from a broken-down wreck into a small but beautiful nature reserve. It's filled with thriving mango trees that have overtaken the ship and are slowly breaking down its hull. In the Gobi Desert, in the northeast part of China, bizarre symbols appeared in certain areas. This led to many theories of what they could be. Maybe ancient markings like the Nazca lines found in Peru. Guesses range from odd weather patterns and pipelines for some future development to target practice areas. But it turned out to be none of those. They're simply special symbols used to calibrate the cameras on China's satellites. The Badlands Guardian in Walsh, Canada is one of the most famous and fascinating spots you can find on Google Earth. It looks like a man's head carved into the landscape. A feather headpiece that Native Americans used to wear sits on top of the head. It must be quite a modern design because the face also seems to have a pair of earphones. Unfortunately, it's just a simple road with an oil rig at the end. From ground level, the entire thing is not nearly as impressive. It looks just like any other exposed rock face that's been changed by the seasons. But this phenomenon is nothing more than the pareidolia effect, the same that makes you see objects in the clouds. An island on a lake on an island in a lake on an island is surely a mouthful. But Google Earth beautifully captured the place. A tiny island named Vulcan Point sits inside a crater lake on an island called Volcano Island inside a lake called Lake Tull on the Philippine islands of Luzon. It's one of the only two lakes in the world that have been discovered to have a third-order island in them. Tall Volcano is still active. And because of the large lake inside the crater, there's a risk of a volcanic tsunami. It can be triggered by debris falling into the lake after an eruption. This might create waves in the lake that can spill over the sides of the crater. The Firefox crop circle appeared in a cornfield in Oregon in 2006. But it wasn't some mystery or rare phenomenon. Celebrating the browser's 50 millionth download, the Linux users group from the Oregon State University created the giant logo. 
It was larger than 45,000 square feet. The group members stomped down all the stocks in a near-perfect circle. It was completed in under 24 hours after two careful weeks of planning. The final circle had a diameter of over 200 feet and was completely invisible from the road. It could only be appreciated from the sky. The most beautiful bright blue ponds are found at the intrepid potash mine near Moab, Utah. Most potash forms in desert regions, where inland seas or lakes dry out. As the water evaporates, it leaves behind potassium salt deposits. Most evaporation ponds are more reddish in color, but some dye was added to these particular ones. Dark water absorbs more sunlight and heat, speeding up the evaporation process. This leaves behind the salts much more quickly. Stunning aerial views of these ponds are a bonus. Making the largest advertising logo on Earth is something every marketing agency would dream of doing. And Coca-Cola did just that in 1986. The logo is an extremely large sculpture. It can only be viewed in its entirety from the sky. The biggest problem about such advertising, though, is that barely anyone knows about it. This huge Coke ad is 160 feet tall and 394 feet wide. It was built from 70,000 empty Coke bottles in northern Chile's Arica. The gigantic monument was created to celebrate the brand's 100-year anniversary. A guitar of this size can only be appreciated from extremely high above. The unusual shaped forest is located south of Cordoba in the Pampa region of Argentina. Known as the Guitar Forest, it extends for more than half a mile. It also contains more than 7,000 cypress and eucalyptus trees. A 74-year-old Argentine farmer, with the help of his children, managed to transform this piece of land into something magical, all done to pay tribute to his beloved wife. From high above, this area seems to be just a collection of boulders in the middle of a lake. But this is actually Hippo Pool in Tanzania. Hippos are common in all the rivers in the area. But this spot is certainly the best in the Serengeti to watch them playing around. The animals there swim in large groups of about 200 hippos. They stir up the waters and fill every square inch of space inside. If you can't get to Tanzania to see the spectacle, Google Earth gives you the opportunity to have this experience in the safety of your home. There are many large-sized pools in the world, and then there's the pool at San Alfonso del Mar, a resort outside of Santiago, Chile. Officially, the world's largest pool ever created. It cost nearly $2 billion to build. The pool is roughly the size of about 16 football fields. The water for the pool is taken from the Pacific Ocean. It gets filtered and treated multiple times a day to keep the gigantic pool clean. There's a saltwater pool inside a large glass pyramid, if you want to swim in a pool inside a pool. I'm getting confused. A strange and mysterious swirling pattern appeared in the desert of Egypt back in 1997. When this design was first discovered on Google Earth, it created a bit of a stir of what it could be. That was until it turned out to be nothing more than a giant art installation called Desert Breath. Two intertwining spirals are complete opposites. One spiral is piles of sand that are shaped like cones, and the other is made of mini craters. When the installation was first completed, the spirals led to the center of a circular pool of water. But since then, the water has dried out. You're flying above Earth on the International Space Station at an altitude of 250 miles. You cast a glance out the porthole, and your eyes widen in surprise. There's some kind of bright blue flash just above nighttime Europe. It's like there was an explosion of some strange substance there. Such a strange luminous event was spotted by a French astronaut from aboard the ISS. And it wasn't an explosion at all. It was lightning and was directed upwards. Until recently, this phenomenon was a kind of fairy tale among pilots. Scientists had heard their stories about lightning striking upward and about red and blue flashes at high altitudes too. But there was no definitive proof of the existence of these luminous events. But they do exist and are called sprites, elves, trolls, and ghosts. So how does ordinary lightning work? 
masses of moist air in a cloud rub against each other and create static electricity. It would be almost the same if you danced in a wool sweater. It becomes charged with static electricity. And if you touch a metal doorknob, there's a discharge between your fingers and the door. There's your lightning. So a thundercloud builds up a strong negative charge. Sooner or later, a leader is born in the cloud. It's a bright thermo-ionized channel, or more simply, lightning. The leader moves toward the ground in steps of a few tens of feet, and it can accelerate to an average speed of 200,000 miles per hour. At that speed, you could make a trip around the Earth in just seven minutes. But negative particles attract positive particles, and particles with opposite charges will tend to connect and compensate for each other. So, simultaneously with the negatively charged leader, the positive charge from the Earth begins its upward journey. The electric charge from the Earth connects with the negatively charged leader in one channel. This is when the brightest and loudest discharge happens. We call it lightning. It's this discharge that you hear as thunder. The main lightning doesn't strike from top to bottom, but from bottom to top. Yep, that is, the lightning is actually directed upward. It's as if the Earth is striking back at the thundercloud. And that charge can reach up to 30,000 amps. Your average wall outlet only has about 15 amps. And the record for the length of lightning is about 440 miles. That's more than the width of the state of Kansas. Meteorologists recorded such lightning in Brazil. It was a discharge between giant thunderclouds. And the longest lightning strike was recorded in Argentina. A single lightning strike there lasted 16.3 seconds. By comparison, you blink at 0.1 seconds. So we saw a regular lightning strike. The positive particles from the ground neutralize the negative particles in the cloud. But the cloud is still full of positively charged particles. They accumulate and wait for their time to create lightning. Once the charge reaches a critical point, the lightning cloud throws that charge dozens of miles upward. This is called a blue jet. It's exactly the same luminous event seen by a French astronaut aboard the International Space Station. The blue jets look like someone turned on a gas burner pointing upward. The positively charged blue jets neutralize at high altitudes with negatively charged particles. But people on the ground cannot observe blue jets. Thunderclouds obstruct the view, but they can be seen from an airplane. That's why, for a long time, commercial airline pilots were the only witnesses to this phenomenon. On board the ISS is also a great place to observe jets, as they are born at the very top of thick clouds and shoot dozens of miles upwards. But if you climb even higher, you can see this kind of bizarre lightning. It's a sprite. It looks more like a jellyfish, a cloud of red charge at the top and a bunch of little tentacles coming down. Now, normal lightning can have a temperature of about 54,000 degrees Fahrenheit, but you can touch a Sprite with your hands. Unless, of course, you're afraid of a powerful electrical discharge. The Sprite has about the same temperature as an energy-saving light bulb. All because Sprites are born in the mesosphere. This is the layer of our atmosphere that starts at about 31 miles high. And it's the coldest place on our planet. On the ground level, where we live, the air is much denser. There are just more air molecules. They absorb heat from the sun's rays, and we feel comfortable. But the higher up we go, the fewer air molecules there are. At the altitude at which commercial airline planes fly, there's no longer enough air to accumulate that heat. You wouldn't even be able to breathe up there. That's why every airplane has oxygen masks for emergencies. And the temperature here is even colder than at the South Pole. In the mesosphere, there's almost no air, and the temperature here can be around negative 202 degrees Fahrenheit. And although the temperature of the lightning itself is high, in general, it's like if you poured a glass of boiling water into a huge barrel of cold water. The temperature won't change much. Sprites can only appear when paired with thunderclouds below. As a discharge occurs in a cloud, a sprite appears in the mesosphere. It tries to equalize the amount of charge in the atmosphere. So it's like these red flashes of lightning are trying to reach down to the thunderstorm. And a sprite itself can be as wide as the state of Massachusetts. And then there's a ghost. It can appear for the tiniest fraction of a second right after the sprite. It's a faint green glow, like an aurora. They were first discovered in 2014. And official confirmation by the scientific community only appeared in 2019. They're still poorly understood, but there's a hypothesis that ghosts have something in common with auroras. At least their color is green, and it may arise due to excited oxygen atoms. 
Sometimes we can spot trolls along with sprites. They look like pillars that support a sprite. It's a red glow at the end of the sprite's tentacles. The next moment, the troll releases a red streak down from itself. And if we climb even higher, we can see the elves. They only appear for one millisecond. It's a dim, flat glow that appears during thunderstorms in the ionosphere at an altitude of about 62 miles above sea level. Elves can be as wide as the distance between New York and Washington, D.C. Elves were first discovered during space shuttle flights in 1990. And these are pixies. They weren't discovered until 2000. Scientists observed bright, brief, luminous events for 20 minutes. Although they look like lightning striking inside a cloud, they have nothing to do with them. Pixies are smaller than 100 meters, which is about 330 feet. We shouldn't forget that any lightning is extremely dangerous for humans. And if you're caught in a severe thunderstorm, you need to leave its epicenter immediately. You can determine how far you are from the epicenter easily. The speed of light is much faster than the speed of sound. So when lightning strikes, it takes a couple of seconds until you hear the thunder. So you need to measure that interval. Lightning, now count the seconds. Every second of thunder delay after lightning is about 1,150 feet. That's the distance a wave of sound travels in one second. So if the thunder delay after a lightning strike is five seconds, you're about one mile from the lightning. You can also tell if there will be a thunderstorm by the smell. The air before a thunderstorm seems unusually fresh. This is because the air currents bring in ozone molecules from the upper atmosphere. The same ozone protects us from harmful ultraviolet rays and transfers heat from the sun to the atmosphere. What we use to breathe is the oxygen of two atoms. Add one more and you get ozone. Ultraviolet light breaks down the two oxygen atoms and is absorbed by them. These broken atoms are then attached to the normal double oxygen atoms. When an ultraviolet beam strikes an ozone molecule, it knocks one oxygen atom out of the chain again. But ozone tends to regenerate. So the lost oxygen is reattached to other double atoms. But the ozone layer began getting damaged when humanity started emitting harmful gas into the atmosphere. Freon is to blame. It's the gas we were using in old refrigerators. The freon molecule contains harmful chlorine atoms. Ultraviolet rays knock this atom out of the molecule. Then that chlorine atom steals one oxygen atom from ozone, and we have a double oxygen molecule that can't regenerate and save us from the harmful ultraviolet rays. This causes a hole to appear in the ozone layer. The most famous ozone hole was over Antarctica. But when humanity banned the use of harmful chemicals, this hole began to recover. It's not that the hole will close completely. It will just return to the way it was before. All aboard! This is the Intergalactic Cruiser. The destination on your ticket is a tour of the local group of galaxies. Featuring the Large and Small Magellanic Galaxies, the Orion Nebula, the Andromeda and Triangulum Galaxies, and a few surprises in between. Tickets, please! Be advised you may experience a slight tingling sensation as we rev into hyperspace. The ship and everything in it is going through a dimensional phase change. It's nothing to worry about. The tingling passes quickly. Now, passengers, as we head toward galactic latitude 180 degrees north, as Terrarians are accustomed to calling it, our first main item of interest will be an intense star-forming region known as M42, the Orion Nebula. But first, a special treat by the captain that's not on the advertised itinerary. The Horsehead Nebula! It's off to the port side, that's left for you Aggies. Its designation is M43. The newborn star at the top of the horse's head has a strong solar wind that is deforming the shape of the nebular cloud. Get a good look at it now, because in a few thousand years, those gases will be completely blown away by the star-like nebula that made our sun. Yep, long gone, except for the nebular gases captured by Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Okay now, one of our junior explorers asks a question. What is the M in M42 and M43? Well, young lady, the M stands for Messier. Pronounce Messier, not Messier, as in, is your room messier than mine? <laughs> Charles Messier, I mean Messier to be precise, was a French astronomer in the 18th century. 
He published a catalog of 110 fuzzy objects as seen through an early telescope. The Horsehead Nebula is number 43 on his list. We'll see more M's as we continue our tour. Heads up, we're coming to the Orion Nebula. The gases in the nebula may seem less colorful than you expect. That's because we're accustomed to seeing long exposure telescopic photos and enhanced photos designed to highlight the different gases in the nebula. May I suggest using the pair of tinted glasses that come with your onboarding packet if you want to heighten your experience. In we go! Now, it's a good thing we are in hyperspace. As we approach the trapezium star cluster in the center, the bright star, Theta C, sends out a solar wind at 5 million miles an hour. It sculpts the whole cloud of gas and dust, creating shock waves that compress nearby stars. Theta C is a megastar, 200,000 times brighter than the sun. It will go supernova in about a million years. I won't be around then. Oxygen, hydrogen, and sulfur glow in ionized states like a fluorescent light bulb. Oxygen blue, hydrogen red, some green and sulfur, and dust glow as yellow-orange. As we pull out of the Orion Nebula and rise high above the galactic plane, the spiral arms of the Milky Way are visible. Our Sun, which you cannot distinguish from this height above the galaxy, is in the Orion Spur that lies between the outer Perseus arm and the inner Sagittarius arm. Notice the center of the Milky Way contains a bright magnetic bar that plays an essential part in star formation. Over 70% of nearby galaxies include magnetic bars. It's a sign of a mature galaxy. Only 20% of distant galaxies contain magnetic bars in their cores. Which reminds me, passengers, the juice bar is now open. Our H1 server will take your orders. Now, that's the Andromeda galaxy far, far out to the port side. But may I call your attention to the many dwarf galaxies, over 40 of them, that populate our galactic neighborhood. We're heading to one now. The Large Magellanic Cloud, LMC to astronomers, is an irregular dwarf satellite galaxy of the Milky Way, containing about 30 billion stars with a dynamic star-forming region called the Tarantula Nebula, which we will be cruising through shortly. Of course, if there is a large Magellanic Cloud, there must be a small Magellanic Cloud, SMC. And there it is, below and to the left of the LMC. The Milky Way will eventually ingest both dwarf galaxies. Some prefer the word accreted, but the result is the same. If you use your tinted glasses again, you can see that the LMC has stripped away a tremendous amount of gas from the SMC, as they have interacted gravitationally over millions of years. Hey, I know all about gas! Now we're heading out of the Milky Way to a distance of about 50 kiloparsecs. That's 50,000 parsecs, or about 163,000 light years. So, what's a parsec? No, it's not slang for pair of socks. A parsec is about 3.26 light years. A light year is about 5.88 trillion miles. The word parsec is a combination of two words, parallax and second. Parallax is the shift an object seems to make when viewed from two different perspectives. Looking at an object with your left eye and then your right eye, you'll see the object appear to shift. That's parallax. When an astronomical object is photographed with the Earth on one side of the Sun and then again six months later on the other side of the Sun, the shift is measurable in degrees of arc or minutes of arc or seconds of arc down to milliseconds of arc. That's a parsec, a parallax of one arc second, which turns out to be 3.26 light years. Hey, what about a Joan of Arc? That's how you measure distances in France. <laughs> Meanwhile, since you can't measure a light year with a ruler or a tape measure, parsecs are the scientific way of telling the distance to a star or intergalactic object. The greater the parallax, the closer the object is. The smaller the parallax, the farther away it is. Now, straight ahead in the heart of the Tarantula Nebula is the R136 star cluster. Within a distance of one light year, there are over 40 stars each with a mass over 50 times that of the Sun. Wow! 
Comparatively, there isn't a single other star within four light years of our home star, Sol, and that's a good thing. You can see Supernova 1987A at about 2 o'clock high. A blue giant star, 100,000 times brighter than the Sun, experienced a core implosion, resulting in a Type II supernova 100 million times brighter than the Sun. It has left behind a neutron star, clouded in dust and gas, and a wildly spectacular display of fireworks. Now, 1987A in the Large Magellanic Cloud is the closest supernova to Earth since 1604, which happened in the Milky Way about 20,000 light years from Earth. It was visible in the daytime for about two weeks, or so. After 1987A went supernova because it was a blue giant star, Speculation has increased that the blue giant star Rigel, the foot star of the constellation Orion, might go supernova in the not-too-distant future, or already has gone supernova. Rigel is approximately 860 light-years from Earth, so anything that happens to Rigel would take about 860 years before it would be noticed on Earth. Supernova 1987A ejected the heavy elements, like cobalt, nickel, and iron, and lighter silicates into the Tarantula Nebula, where they will form the basic building blocks of stars and planets. Our server is now offering space-themed snacks. May I recommend the Jupiter Cotton Candy Puffs for the children on board? Aww. Remember, I know all about gas. Our next stop is the Andromeda Galaxy and Environs. Notice its halo as we leave the Milky Way and its 300 billion stars behind. As many as 150 globular clusters reside in the galactic halo. They orbit down and through the galactic disk and contain some of the oldest stars in the universe. How they got here in our home galaxy is a matter of intense study. You will notice NGC 6822, an irregular dwarf galaxy off to the starboard. NGC stands for New General Catalog of Astronomical Objects. Now you'd think there'd have been an old general catalog, but there wasn't. It was just a new catalog. There is, however, a revised new general catalog which astronomers refer to regularly. Clears that up, huh? As we pass NGC 6822, you'll notice a magnetic bar beginning to form and bright patches of new star formation. This galaxy was discovered in 1884 by E.E. E. Barnard, and is also called Barnard's Galaxy. Mr. Barnard was quite an astronomical observer. He has a crater on the moon named for him, one on Mars, an area on Jupiter's moon Ganymede, a minor planet, number 819 Bernardania, and the star with the fastest movement across the sky, Bernard Star. Now, not too many people have their name emblazoned across space, as has Edward Emerson Bernard. Approaching the giant Andromeda galaxy with its trillion stars, we will skirt above its western edge and visit one of the enormous galaxy's dwarf companion galaxies, M110 or NGC 205. Yes, it also has two designations. Hey, take your pick. The first of its kind, a dwarf spheroidal galaxy of about 3.5 billion solar masses, M110 or NGC 205 if you wish, has eight globular clusters near its core. It too will be swallowed, or accreted if you prefer, by the Andromeda galaxy. It may have already been stripped of much of its stars and gas, a point highlighted by M110's general lack of star formation. Everybody having fun yet? And now, our final stop, M33, the Triangulum Galaxy, the third and last spiral galaxy of our local group. Located in the small constellation of Triangulum, Latin for triangle, good guess, M33 is about half the size of the Milky Way. The Triangulum Galaxy is 2.7 million light years from Earth, but it is much closer to the Andromeda Galaxy and moving towards it. If two spiral galaxies collide, it may alter the course of the Andromeda Galaxy and prevent the predicted collision with the Milky Way. Well, let's hope so. Now, this important message. We will serve dinner on our return trip to Earth. There's a choice of chicken or fish. We hope you have enjoyed the tour.
Hey, if you fill out our survey and give us five stars, you can also have dessert. So, once they explode, stars aren't supposed to come back to life. But some of the stars somehow have survived the great supernova explosion. Such zombie stars are pretty rare. Scientists found a really big one called LP4365. It's a partially burnt white dwarf. Now, a white dwarf is a star that has burned up all of the hydrogen, and that hydrogen was previously its nuclear fuel. In this case, the final explosion was maybe weaker than it usually is, not powerful enough to destroy the entire star. It's like a star wanted to explode but didn't make it, which is why part of the matter still survived. One of those zombie stars used to be a white dwarf, or just left over from an explosion. It gobbled up too much from another star and, surprisingly, managed to explode once again. If you manage to go to the moon one day and see fresh footprints, that doesn't mean there's someone else there with you. Footprints or similar marks can last for a million years over there because the moon doesn't have an atmosphere. There are no winds, not even a breeze, that can slowly erase those footprints. In outer space, you'd be strong enough to weld two pieces of metal together with your own hands. Okay, it has nothing to do with your strength. You could just press them together with no effort, and that's it. Oxygen in our atmosphere makes a thin layer on the surface of the metal. It's like a barrier, which is why such a trick is impossible on Earth, but perfectly logical in outer space. If you ever go to space, don't take off your spacesuit unless you're on a spaceship. Air in your lungs would expand, as well as the oxygen in the rest of your body. You'd be like a balloon, twice your regular size. Good news? The skin is elastic enough to hold you together, which means you wouldn't explode. Yeah, small comfort, huh? If you watch a very touching movie in space and start crying, your tears won't run down. They will gather around your eyeballs. Your eyes will get too dry, so you'll feel like they're burning. Any exposed liquid on your body will vaporize, including the surfaces of your tongue. Speaking of burning, there's one thing fire can't do in space. Fire can spread when there's a flow of oxygen, and since there's not any in space. If the fire breaks out in a rocket, you can simply turn off the ventilation system and voila! It can get more complicated if there's intense smoke sparking and material melting in conditions of reduced gravity. Regular foam fire extinguishers we use on Earth are useless here because they release foam randomly. Researchers are developing a fire extinguisher that will put out fires by using sound waves. The bigger the sound intensity, the bigger the flame they can put out. But the astronauts might end up deaf if their frequency is too high. A black hole is not like some starving monster that wanders around and has gravity so strong nothing can really escape it. When something comes close to the point of no return, which we also call the event horizon, it disappears. No way back. But quantum physics claims nothing can really destroy data. So it's a true paradox. Stephen Hawking was the one with the idea of how black holes don't really have event horizons. Maybe they have apparent horizons. Those trap things for some time only. After that, the trapped energy will somehow get away, but in a different form. When something goes into a black hole, it changes shape and gets stretched out just like spaghetti. It happens because gravitational force is trying to stretch an object in one direction, but at the same time squeeze it in another. Like a pasta paradox. Speaking of, a black hole that's as big as a single atom has the mass of a really big mountain. There's one at the center of the Milky Way called Sagittarius A. It has a mass like 4 billion suns, but luckily it's far away from us. There are more than 23,000 pieces of so-called space junk bigger than a softball floating above our planet at speeds up to 17,500 miles per hour. Woo! And there are 500,000 pieces in general, some of them the size of a marble. Space waste is generally debris made up of natural particles called meteoroids and artificial particles, like things we make on the Earth. Meteoroids orbit the Sun while the majority of human-made debris orbits our planet. For example, we launched almost 9,000 spacecraft around the world, from satellites to rocket ships. 
Even the tiniest pieces can damage a spacecraft at such high speeds. Galaxies, planets, comets, asteroids, stars, space bodies are things we can actually see in space. But they make up less than 5% of the total universe. Dark matter, one of the biggest mysteries in space, is the name we use for all the mass in the universe that's still invisible to us. There's a lot of it. It may even make 25% of the universe. Dark energy makes the rest of the 70% of the universe. Scientists don't know much about it, but they think dark energy could be behind the increasing expansion of the entire universe, while dark matter slows it down. Dark matter doesn't interact with us in any way that we know of, nor does it interact with itself. If it did, we might be able to find dark matter galaxies, dark matter planets, or such objects. Now, astronomers have found the largest hole we've ever seen in the universe. It's the giant void that spreads a billion light years across. They found it accidentally. One of the research team members was a little bit bored and wanted to check out how things were going in the direction of the cold spot. That's an anomaly in the cosmic microwave background map, or in short, CMB. It's a faint glow of light that falls on our planet from different directions and fills the universe. It's been streaming through space for almost 14 billion years as the afterglow that occurred after the Big Bang. But instead of CMB, they realized there's a giant area way colder than they'd expected. The team started tracking radio signals, but there were no radio sources in that whole volume. That means there are no galaxies or clusters, and since it's so cold, there's no dark matter either, or regular matter. So it really doesn't matter. The giant void is empty, and researchers think it could consist of dark energy. Light can still pass through it. It's not the only void in space, but it's the biggest one we've found. The area around a star is habitable when it's not too cold or too hot for liquid water to exist on the planet surrounding it. Let's say our planet was where Pluto is. It's too far from the sun, which means our ocean and big parts of its atmosphere would freeze. But if the Earth was in Mercury's place, we'd be too close to the sun, and the water on our planet would evaporate. Such habitable area is called the Goldilocks zone. So you can see where planets are located and assume if they have a chance for life on their surface. But Europa, one of Jupiter's moons, definitely breaks the rule. It's outside of the Goldilocks zone, but still kept warm. Not from the sun directly, but Jupiter and its moons that actually pump energy into Europa. Europa changes its shape as it circles around Jupiter. It's similar to tides rising and falling on our planet. Water on the Earth changes its shape as a response to the tidal forces of our moon. When the same happens with a solid object, the object is stressed. That's how you pump energy into that object. It's like you're playing racquetball. You hit the ball around a couple of times before you start playing like you're warming it up. You kind of distort the ball every time you smack it. The surface of Europa is frozen, but it has cracks in the ice. You can see ridges in the ice where there's a crack. Then those flying chunks shift and refreeze. You'd see a similar thing if you could fly over the Arctic Ocean in the wintertime. There are ice sheets constantly breaking and refreezing. So Europa can't completely freeze. Scientists think there could be an ocean of liquid water under the icy surface. Europa is not the only moon where this is happening. Another of Jupiter's moons, Io, is also warm because of such tidal forces. Io also has volcanoes erupting from within all the time. So it's not only that the Sun warms the space bodies and pumps them with energy. Many experts agree the universe might come to its end about 3 to 22 billion years from now. It's expanding all the time, which means it formed from a compact state. If it has a beginning, it's probably going to have an end as well. Yeah, I won't be around for that. One of the popular theories says the growth will slow down, and gravity will become the powerful force that will make the universe shrink. That will lead to complete chaos. Galaxies, stars, planets, space bodies, they will all move, collide, and, you know, destroy one another. It's like the reverse Big Bang. Huge chaos, but this time, everything collapses. Well, on that cheery note, always stay on the bright side of life. Our Sun is an average-sized star, and still, it could fit 1,300,000 Earths. The star is also 333,000 times as heavy as our planet. 
NASA has translated radio waves created by planets' atmospheres into audible sounds. That's how astronomers found out that Neptune sounds like ocean waves. Jupiter, like being underwater. And Saturn's voice resembles background music to a horror movie. Here on Earth, it's bebop jazz. Now I made that up. The sun's surface is scorching hot, but a bolt of lightning is five times hotter. Earth gets struck by 100 lightning bolts every second, which results in 8 million lightning strikes a day and around 3 billion a year. Ooh, shocking. If you manage to go to the moon one day and see fresh footprints, that doesn't mean there's someone else there with you. Footprints or similar marks can last for a million years over there. Because the moon doesn't have an atmosphere. There are no winds, not even a breeze, that can slowly erase those footprints. Astronomers have found the largest hole we've ever seen in the universe. It's the giant void that spreads a billion light years across. They found it accidentally. One of the research team members was a little bored and wanted to check how things are going in the direction of the cold spot. That's an anomaly in the Cosmic Microwave Background Map, or CMB for short. It's a faint glow of light that falls on our planet from different directions and fills the universe. It's been streaming through space for almost 14 billion years as the afterglow that occurred after the Big Bang. So you fall right into the heart of the black hole and prepare for a sad end. Well, you don't have to. Falling into a black hole won't necessarily destroy you or your spaceship. You have to choose a bigger black hole to survive. If you fall into a small black hole, its event horizon is too narrow, and the gravity increases every inch down. So if you extend your arm forward, the gravity on your fingers is much stronger than on your elbow. This will make your hand lengthen, and you'll feel some… discomfort. Rather significant, to be honest. Things change if you fall into a supermassive black hole, like the ones in the center of galaxies. They can be millions of times heavier than the Sun. Their event horizon is wide, and the gravity doesn't change as quickly. So, the force you'll feel at your heels and at the top of your head will be about the same. And you can go all the way to the heart of the black hole. This myth is busted. If you watch a very touching movie in space and start crying, your tears won't run down. They will gather around the eyeballs. Your eyes will get too dry, so you'll feel like they're burning. Any exposed liquid on your body will vaporize, including the surfaces of your tongue. Speaking of burning, that's one thing fire can't do in space. Fire can spread when there's a flow of oxygen. And since there's not any in space, well… Once they explode, stars aren't supposed to come back to life. But some of the stars somehow has survived the great supernova explosion. Such zombie stars are pretty rare. Scientists found a really big one called LP40-365. It's a partially burnt white dwarf. A white dwarf is a star that burned up all of the hydrogen, and that hydrogen was previously its nuclear fuel. In this case, the final explosion was maybe weaker than it usually is, not powerful enough to destroy the entire star. It's like a star wanted to explode but didn't make it, which is why part of the matter still survived. If you ever go into space, don't take off your spacesuit unless you're on a spaceship. Air in your lungs would expand, as well as the oxygen in the rest of your body. You'd be like a balloon, twice your regular size. Good news? The skin is elastic enough to hold you together, which means you wouldn't explode. <laughs> Small comfort. When something goes into a black hole, it changes shape and gets stretched out just like spaghetti. This happens because gravitational force is trying to stretch an object in one direction but at the same time, squeeze it into another, like a pasta paradox. Speaking of, a black hole that's as big as a single atom has the mass of a really big mountain. There's one at the center of the Milky Way called Sagittarius A. It has a mass like for a billion suns, but luckily, it's far away from us. If you made a big boom on an asteroid, you'd never be able to hear its loud sound. Yes, we often hear the sound of spaceships and battles in space in the movies, but that's just a myth. 
sound is a wave that spreads because of the vibrations of molecules. A person claps a few feet away from you, the sound wave begins to push the first air molecule next to the clap, then the second, third, and so on, until the wave reaches your ear. So, to spread sound, we need molecules like air or water. In our atmosphere, sound waves spread out just fine, but space is a vacuum, so it's nothing here. You can clap your hands loudly there, but there just won't be any molecules that can vibrate and carry that sound. So, to carry on a conversation, you'd either need a radio or really good lip-reading skills. Meteoroids orbit the sun, while the majority of human-made debris orbits our planet. For example, we launched almost 9,000 spacecraft around the world from satellites to rocket ships. Even the tiniest pieces can damage a spacecraft at such high speeds. Galaxies, planets, comets, asteroids, stars, space bodies are things we can actually see in space. But they make up less than 5% of the total universe. Dark matter, one of the biggest mysteries in space, is the name we use for all the mass in the universe that's still invisible to us. And there's a lot of it. It may even make 25% of the universe. Dark energy makes the other 70% of the universe. Hmm, that adds up to 100, right? Now, let's look at the moon. It always looks at us with one side. This means the moon has a dark side, and the sun's rays never get there. Well, that's a myth. The whole point is that the moon is gravitationally locked to the Earth. There are days and nights there, too. It's just that this rotation is perfectly aligned with the rotation of the Earth. So whenever you look at the moon, you only see one side. Although there are days when the sun shines there too, so it's not the dark side, it's the far side. And we even have pictures of this place. And there's one of the biggest craters in our entire solar system, the South Pole Aiken Basin. It's as wide as two states of Texas. Yeehaw! One myth that turned out to be untrue is that people have never actually been on the moon. This is the original spacesuit of the first astronauts who were there. Look at the sole of the shoe. Some people claim there's no way they could have left footprints like this there. Actually, they could. On the moon, the astronauts wore extra boots over their suits, and their soles matched the footprints on the moon perfectly. Now, the astronauts didn't need them when they left the moon and tossed them when the moonwalk was over. They left a lot of stuff there, too. They even tossed the armrests of the seats in the lunar module to reduce the weight. Now, counting all the Apollo lunar missions, the total weight of rubbish on the moon is approximately 187 tons, including several lunar rovers, spacecraft debris, six lunar modules, and all the experiments left behind. That's like three Boeing 737s. Another myth about the sun is that it's yellow. Let's send you into space for this one. You look out the window and it's white! The sun only appears yellow to us through the filter of our atmosphere. The composition of the air and its thickness just distorts the light of the star. But stars do come in different colors. Cooler stars have bright orange and red colors. These are usually very old stars, older than our sun. But young and very hot stars are bright blue. The sun is about in the middle of the spectrum. Oh, one more myth about asteroids. We need to fly a little farther than Mars's orbit. Whoa, we're in an asteroid belt, and we constantly have to dodge giant rocks and blocks of ice. We got in some dense asteroid clouds. Hmm, not true. The fact is that space is huge, and the distances are incredible. All the rocks and debris in the asteroid belt are only 4% of the weight of the moon. So there really aren't that many of them there. To understand the dimension of the emptiness in space, look at the collision of two galaxies. There are billions of stars in each of them. If we mix them up, it's unlikely there will be any collisions even here. In space, no one can hear you scream. Or is that in space, no one can hear ice cream? Well, either way, we know that no supernovas, crashing asteroids, and burning planets make a sound in space. Or do they? What if you actually can hear something out there? Well, let's see. 
Okie dokie, back to middle school. Ahem. Sound is a mechanical way of originating from vibration. Uh, what exactly does that mean? Well, the simplest example is guitar strings. Let's pluck one of them. It starts to vibrate. The atoms inside the metal string begin to push and beat the atoms of the air around them. So now, atoms are constantly pushing each other until they reach our ears. It's like a wave from a pebble thrown into a pond, and it happens very quickly at a speed of about 761 miles per hour. Then our eardrums begin to vibrate at the same frequency. And the little bones inside our ears transmit this vibration to the brain. The brain then does its magic, recognizes the pattern, and turns it into sounds. Great! Now we know that we need some particles to create sound. And we can find these particles in gases, liquids, and solid substances. And what about space? Nope, it's almost a perfect vacuum. And you've probably already heard that there's no sound in space because it's a vacuum. But what does it actually mean? Well, a vacuum is a perfect void. It's an area completely devoid of matter. It means there's nothing there. Yeah. Despite all those celestial bodies in space, there's actually no air in between them. No atoms, no particles, nothing. Not a zippo. Well, almost. To be honest, the perfect vacuum doesn't really exist. We can't get rid of atoms for good. But space is very close to this notion. On average, there are 15 to 80 atoms per one cubic inch. This may sound like a big number, but keep in mind that these atoms are tiny, and the void distance between them is huge. For comparison, one cubic inch of air contains about 16,000 atoms. So, of course, with such a low density, these atoms can't push each other. Even if the vibration is very strong, like, I don't know, a supernova, they still won't be able to do that. So, movies have been lying to us! All these epic space scenes actually take place in an awkward silence. Who would have guessed? But don't get upset. What if I tell you there are, in fact, some ways to hear sound in space? First of all, there's still sound on other planets. If there's an atmosphere on a space body, or at least something like gas, water, or a solid surface, there will be sound. In our case, the atmosphere becomes completely silent at about 60 miles above the Earth's surface. That's where the sky stops being blue and a black starry veil begins. In any case, we'd have to land on another planet, or at least get close to its atmosphere, to hear something. But whatever it is, it would sound very different. Let's take our favorite Venus as an example. The atmosphere there is very dense. Scientists jokingly call it a thick chemical soup. No thanks. So, if you somehow managed to stay alive and speak there, your voice would be very different. It would become much louder, and it would sound so, if you want a pleasant baritone, you know what to do. I wonder what would happen if Earth had a denser atmosphere. What would we hear then? Well, you can vaguely imagine that if you've ever been in the water. Water is very dense. Sound moves there much faster and better compared to the air, at a speed of almost a mile per second, depending on the water temperature. So if you sit in an empty room with no sound sources, you won't hear much, right? Now, dip your head in the water and check out how the same silence sounds here. It's not quiet at all. Even if you ignore the ever-present sounds of the water itself, you'll immediately notice how well you can hear your own body, how your blood pulsates in the veins, how your heart works, the slightest movement of your fingers. Kind of creepy, isn't it? This gives us an idea of what would happen to us on a planet with a denser atmosphere. And that's just crazy. We would hear everything. From scurrying animals to the movement of tectonic plates. Ah, come on, you'd probably say. It's obvious that there's sound on other planets. But didn't you say we can hear something in open space? Actually, yes. For example, in a cloud of dust. You can find space dust almost everywhere in space. It may be the remains of a star or something else. And in these places, everything is a bit denser than usual. This means there are probably dust clouds where particles are very close to each other, which means they can produce sounds. Of course, those will be very quiet and transmitted over a very short distance. 
but it's better than nothing, right? Plus, we already have one real space sound recorded. It came from the Perseus galaxy, which is located 250 million light-years away from us. NASA recorded it in 2003. Those of us music geeks will want to know that it's a B-flat, 57 octaves below middle C on the piano. You'd have to add another 660 keys to the left on the keyboard. But its frequency is so low that the human ear unfortunately can't hear it. But besides that, we can only hear something inside spaceships. These are small pockets of air, after all. In a spacesuit, you would hear sounds very well, too, including your breathing or blood circulation in a spacesuit. But two astronauts flying side-by-side side wouldn't hear each other, even if they got very close and shouted very loudly. It's quite funny. If you, being an astronaut, bumped into something, it would be very loud for you, but your friend wouldn't hear anything. That's why astronauts use radio devices. 2091, cast your call to a 79 handle. Now, purely theoretically, if you could somehow crawl out of your spacesuit and survive, you'd be able to hear the chatter and noises going on inside the spaceship. But how? So look, we have some air inside the spaceship, and it transmits sound. It reaches the metal casing and gets through it. And then, if you leaned against the ship, preferably touching it with your elbow or knee, the sound would be transmitted to the brain directly through your bones, ignoring the ears. Yes, our bones conduct sound. That's how, for example, deaf people listen to music. It's called bone conduction. It's used in some headphones and some other technologies. You can do a little experiment. Hold your fingers over your ears. Shut them properly so that you really don't hear much. Then try to touch a sound source. It can be anything vibrating. For example, a speaker playing music with some part of your body where the bone is close to the skin. Now, watch the miracle happen. You can hear the sound not through your ears, but directly in your brain. But please, don't repeat this experiment in open space. You know, ice cream? <laughs> now, you've probably heard about things like the sounds of space, where you can listen, for example, to the sounds made by the sun or different planets. How do we record these ones? Easily. There is another way to hear sound in space. Electromagnetic waves. In other words, a radio. Radio is the same form of electromagnetic radiation as light. These waves can travel in a vacuum without any problems. Astronauts' transmitters work that way. An astronaut says something to their friend. The sound waves turn into radio waves, reach the other person, and are then converted back into sounds. And this is how we get so-called space sounds. Our planet is actually very loud in that regard. We're sending a huge amount of radio waves into the universe, all radio signals we've ever listened to. It's a pity that they travel only 110 light years away from us. But you know, I think it's good that we don't hear everything that happens in space. Imagine if sound could easily travel through the universe? We would hear everything, from solar flares to nearby supernovas. Horrifying, right? So maybe we're just lucky. Hey, remember, in space, you can hear ice cream. Chocolate! Vanilla! No one will hear your cry in space, or something like that. We've all heard this famous chilling phrase, and it's actually true. Space, for the most part, consists of a giant nothingness. There's a lot of, you know, space in space. But this doesn't mean there are no sounds in space. In fact, there are plenty of them. And some of them can even make you shiver. Let's take a look at the scariest space sounds. First of all, how are cosmic sounds even recorded? Sound is just the vibration of molecules. When you scream, you make the molecules push each other furiously until they reach the ear of the person you're yelling at. Then these vibrations get transmitted to the brain, and we recognize them as something that you might need to apologize for. In other words, to hear something, we need molecules. And that's where things get complicated. There aren't any of them in space. The entire universe almost completely consists of a vacuum. No, not a hoover. Absolute nothingness. However, the wizards from NASA still record space sound somehow. So how do they do it? The thing is, there are some types of waves that don't care about molecules. We regular folk can't perceive them without some special devices. 
These waves include, for example, radio waves. We'll need a radio or something like that to recognize them. And that's exactly what NASA's satellites do. They catch random radio waves. Thanks to their heroism, we can find out how different cosmic bodies sound. These satellites record a variety of waves, fluctuations of plasmas, magnetic fields, and other, you know, stuff. And then scientists from NASA transform all this into normal soundtracks. And some of them sound quite frightening, to put it mildly. Let's take our magnetic field, for example. It surrounds our planet like an invisible shield, protecting us from all sorts of nasties, like radiation and solar winds. At the same time, we can neither see it, feel it, nor hear. Oops. Well, the last one is outdated. Scientists from the Technical University of Denmark took magnetic waves recorded by the ESA swarm satellite. They converted them into an audio track and got a pretty creepy result. Now, to be honest, it sounds more like an eerie entity stalking you in the middle of the night. And if you remember the maps of Earth's magnetic field, it starts to feel like a spider crawling nearby. Ew. And this isn't the first strange sound that we caught on Earth. Recently, we caught another weird radio emission from space. Scientists found out that the repeating signal came from somewhere very far away, like billions of light years away from us. Such fast radio bursts usually lasted no longer than a few milliseconds, but this one was unique. It lasted about three seconds, basically thousands of times longer than usual. And at the same time, the signal was very precise, so much so that scientists even compared it to a heartbeat. Scientists believe that this signal is caused by pulsars, or neutron stars. One time, Nikola Tesla caught something similar. But unfortunately, at that time, we didn't know about such things as pulsars. So Tesla was sure that he had caught a message from some extraterrestrial life. It's a pity that the truth turned out to be much more boring. But let's move on from the Earth to the Moon. In 1969, the astronauts of the Apollo 10 mission, the spacecraft that made the final test flight to the moon, flew past its surface. And then they caught some strange signals coming from the dark side of the moon, the side that we never see because the moon is tidally locked to us. The sound was so weird that the astronauts weren't even sure whether to report it to NASA. They were afraid they wouldn't be taken seriously, and maybe even not allowed to participate in the next space missions. Here's what it sounded like. But according to NASA, it's not some creepy extraterrestrial music at all. These may just be some radio waves that affected each other because of their proximity. Although the astronauts who heard it for the first time probably felt a little creeped out. Let's move to the other planets. Now, 40 years ago, scientists actively explored the surface of Venus. They sent as many as 10 probes there, which were supposed to capture audio and video shooting from the surface. Now we know what Venus, which could easily destroy us at any attempt to even get close to it, sounds like. Horrifying. And you wouldn't expect anything else from the most dangerous planet in the solar system. Unfortunately, Venus is even more toxic than the average Twitter user. <laughs> so these probes didn't last too long. They heroically arrived on a planet and soon broke down. Next one is Jupiter. This space giant, which is 11 times larger than the Earth, never fails to scare us. One of NASA's probes, Juno, flies around Jupiter every few weeks. The probe is moving at a tremendous speed, 130,000 miles per hour. One day, Juno caught one of the strongest invisible signals it had ever encountered. This was the point at which the mad solar wind came into conflict with the magnetic field of Jupiter. It kind of sounded like a cosmic boom. The original sound lasted two hours, but it was compressed to a few seconds. It actually sounds more like a collision of a sea wave and a rock. But here, in terms of horror, Jupiter surprisingly loses to one of its small moons, Ganymede. In 2021, the Galileo space probe flew past Ganymede, and during its flight, it received a rather strange recording. These sounds are satellite radiation, and it's unclear whether it sounds like a cozy sunny day in the jungle or like thousands of bats waiting for you in the night. Next one is Saturn. This signal was caught by the Cassini-Huygens Automatic Interplanetary Station, 
which was launched into space in 1997. When flying past Saturn, Cassini recorded a pretty scary sound. This terrifying cry of thousands of souls is actually just some radio waves. They aren't too different from what the auroras emit on Earth. A little later, Cassini received another recording. The sounds made by lightning and thunderstorms on Saturn. They sound pretty interesting, too. More like popping corn or a Geiger counter, right? But that's just because these lightning strikes have a crazy frequency. Moving on from the solar system to outer space. The famous Voyager 1 was launched back in 1977 and continues to send us data even 40 years after its launch. In 2012, it left the solar system and entered interstellar space. And then, while abandoning its home, Voyager 1 detected the sound of plasma waves. The original recording lasted seven months. But fortunately, scientists felt sorry for us and reduced it to 12 seconds. It isn't really eerie, but is still kind of unsettling. And although it feels like nothing can beat Saturn's horrors, let's end this tournament with one of the scariest objects in the universe, a black hole. This sound was recorded by the Chandra Space Telescope. While studying a cluster of galaxies in the constellation Perseus, they discovered something strange. Some undulating movements appear from the center of the cluster. They spread out in all directions, like circles on the water. Scientists have suggested that this was caused by a supermassive black hole. The thing is, black holes don't always devour space objects entirely. Sometimes they kind of spit them out. This causes vibrations of gases, which we can convert into sound tracks. What's interesting is that the oscillation of each such wave actually lasts about 10 million years. You're just listening to a very accelerated recording. Scientists have reduced the delay between oscillations by about 144 quadrillion times. So let's check it out. This is probably the eeriest sound from the whole list. Nothing too loud or wild, but there's something dark and disturbing about it. Now, those were the scariest space sounds captured by NASA. To be fair, most of them sounded creepy simply because they're radio waves. But it's still fun to get spooked sometimes. Ah, consider the rogue planet, the cosmic wanderer that nobody wants to take home. Basically, a rogue planet is a planet that has been ejected from its own star system and is now floating aimlessly through space like a cosmic loner. These planets aren't just a theory. Scientists have actually detected some in our galaxy. In fact, estimates suggest that there may be lots of these cosmic nomads floating around the Milky Way. And they aren't just small rocky worlds like Earth. Some of them are actually massive gas giants, many times larger than Jupiter. These behemoths could potentially have their own moons, and even their own mini-systems orbiting around them. For example, one of the most famous rogue planets we know of has a complicated name. Here, you read it for yourself. It's located about 80 light-years away from Earth, and it was discovered in 2013. This rogue planet is estimated to be around 6 times the mass of Jupiter, and is believed to be around 12 million years old. And yes, just because these cosmic loners don't have a star, it doesn't mean they're super cold. They can still generate heat and light from their own internal processes. Some may even have magnetic fields and auroras, just like Earth. In other words, rogue planets could potentially be habitable, if they have the right conditions. So, what would life on such a planet look like? And could we potentially live in such a world? Well, living on a rogue planet can be a lonely existence. They have no warm sun to bask in, no cozy atmosphere to cuddle up in, and no cosmic neighbors to have barbecue with. That's why we'd have to get creative. Let's start with the most obvious problem. We'd have a hard time without light and heat. So how do we fix this? Well, we'd probably have to invest in some really fancy space heaters and wear fashionable super warm spacesuits. Or we could invent a whole new way to generate electricity without relying on solar power. For example, how about using geothermal energy? Now that's hot stuff! Each planet has an internal source of heat. Without it, they would all be nothing more than cold, lifeless rocks floating through space. This internal heat can be harnessed and used to power everything, 
from homes to factories to spaceships. It's like having a hot tub big enough to power an entire city. And that city, most likely, will be located underground, closer to the heat source. And as for light, well, we'd probably have to build some really bright flashlights. Or maybe even learn to genetically engineer some bioluminescent organisms to light up our homes. Just imagine, space space is overgrown with neon mushrooms and plants. By the way, speaking of plants, plant life would be pretty hard to come by without a star. So what would we eat? Well, we could use the same geothermal vents that we talked about, or some chemical reactions to sustain ourselves. And hey, maybe we'd develop a taste for sulfur-rich foods, or we'd start fermenting our own drinks from the bubbling volcanic mud. Yum! But besides food, we'd have a more important problem. Living on a rogue planet would be breathtaking, literally. We'd have no air. You see, not all rogue planets have good, stable atmospheres. It all depends on their size, composition, and other things. But even if our new home does have an atmosphere, it may be incredibly thin and unstable. We'd have no pretty blue skies or dramatic sunsets to admire. Instead, we'd be staring out into the infinite void of space, where the stars would be brighter than ever before. And forget about weather patterns. Without an atmosphere to create them, we'd have no rain, no snow, and no thunderstorms. And that's just some minor problems. What's worse, the temperature on the planet would be wildly fluctuating, swinging from unbearable heat to unbearable cold. It would be like living in an oven that's always being turned on and off. And finally, we'd be exposed to all kinds of space debris and cosmic radiation. So, if you don't want to get crispy, you might want to invest in some serious SPF. So, how do we fix it? Well, we'd have to find a way to generate our own oxygen and probably create something like a space-age biosphere. For example, we could grow some plants that could produce oxygen. Or we'd learn to filter the air like a high-tech air purifier. Finally, we have the last most important problem – finding water. And here's where the underwater oceans come to our aid. Now we're really diving deep into the possibilities. Nyuk, nyuk. But seriously, scientists suggest that some of these planets may indeed have underwater oceans. It would be like living on a giant water balloon that's been buried underground, with the ground beneath your feet made of ice and rock. In other words, we could just tap into these underground oceans. They could provide us with a source of water for drinking, farming, and manufacturing. Maybe even with some other resources and materials we've never seen before. And by the way, who knows what kind of strange creatures might be lurking in those underground seas. But don't worry. Even if we don't have any underground oasis, there are also other options. We could get some water from comets, ice mining, and even from the atmosphere, the one we just created before. Finally, we need to find and mine some resources to build our homes and other stuff. And a rogue planet might not have the same kinds of resources as a planet that orbits a star. It's like trying to find some treasures in a desert. Not exactly a sure thing. We may have to rely on resources from nearby asteroids and things like that. And if we want to extract resources from the planet itself, we might need to drill down through miles of ice and rock. But hey, if you're up for the challenge, there'll always be a chance you'll strike it rich on a rogue planet. And who knows? Maybe you'll discover some new resources that are even more valuable than gold or diamonds. Great! Looks like we've solved the most important problems. Now, there may be other small difficulties. For example, we'd also have to deal with some seriously long days and nights, depending on how fast our planet was rotating. And we wouldn't have a normal, regular day-night cycle. The rotation of our planet could be wildly unpredictable. Maybe we'd have weeks-long nights followed by weeks-long days, which could really mess with our sleep schedules. We might have to develop some really strong coffee to keep us going through those long, dark nights. But, hypothetically, we can adapt to all these things and overcome all the challenges. And now, finally, welcome to the rogue planet, where the sun never rises, but the adventures never end. Thanks to our advanced technology, we've managed to create a comfortable and habitable environment in this once barren world. The sky above us is now a beautiful shade of blue, 
filled with fluffy white clouds and the occasional flock of flying creatures. Don't ask. As we venture out from our underground habitats, we're greeted by a world that's full of surprises. Strange plants and animals have adapted to the unique conditions of this planet, some with bioluminescent features that glow in the dark. And be careful if you want to go swimming in the underground ocean. They might be home to some bizarre creatures who want to feast on… well, we'll come back to that. Maybe. As you can see, we've created sprawling cities and thriving communities, powered by the planet's geothermal energy. We also created a bunch of artificial light sources that keep things bright throughout the dark, chilly nights. Of course, we still have some problems with navigation and timekeeping, but things aren't as dull as they used to be, are they? Overall, living on a rogue planet would definitely have its challenges, but it could also be a pretty exciting way to experience the universe. And who knows? Maybe someday we'll find such a planet and actually turn it into a bustling intergalactic metropolis someday. But until then, let's enjoy and tidy up our 